Hello, bonjour, ni hao. My name is Stephanie Ling. I've had opportunity to build my international career and meet a lot of amazing talents in my journey. It's my pleasure to present an amazing selection of professionals and entrepreneurs who went extra mile to build their international career and create some crazy good things. I hope their work and hard-earned wisdom will help you learn, connect, and live the best of your lives. Come join us at www.stephenlingme.com to get additional tips that we won't share anywhere else. Let's begin the journey. In this episode, I'm very excited to interview Kevin Pereira, an AI expert. Kevin also shared his exclusive tips on how to free yourself from business during economic downturn in the time of pandemic on our website. Here's the one and only Kevin Pereira. So at Blue Artificial Intelligence, there's really four main areas that we look at, and it's probably in line with how we see the entire process of going from thinking about what you want to do with artificial intelligence to ultimately doing it. So the first area is education. We concentrate a lot on that part because, in general, we see a lot of reluctance, fear, etc., about AI, and so often we find that that's the most important part to address. Before you start an actual project with a client, so in terms of our services, we actually do corporate workshops for C-suite level folks and also for strategy and innovation teams. The idea there is really to tell them what AI can do and ultimately show them some use cases that can be done in their industry as well. In addition to that, we also do a lot of conferences, workshops, and speeches to help generally increase the awareness of AI. Because I think that really forms the basis for more usage and more adoption. After we're done with the education part, we often find that clients want to think about the strategy. And in our view, strategy should lead AI. AI should never lead strategy. So that part of our discussion is really thinking about an AI strategy roadmap, taking into account what the client strategy is, and then seeing where we can add AI on top of that. And then once you have both the strategy piece completed. The next part is to think about implementation, and for us, implementation comes in two parts. The first part is really thinking about what AI tools you're going to use, what AI use cases are you addressing, and ultimately, is there a piece of software that you have to buy from a third party, or is there a piece of software that you need to develop in house? So there's a buy and build component, and so that's really part of the implementation aspect.、Uh, we've got a team that can do the implementation, and sometimes we also look at third party products. If that third-party product fits the use case, right? So we understand what the universe of products is out there, and we understand the, the business use case of the client. And ultimately, the question is: put those two together if they exist. And if they don't exist, then what we try and do is help them build a new product from scratch. The next part is really culture and change management, and this falls in some ways under education as well to a certain extent. But it's also purely based on how the culture of the firm. Is ready to embrace AI. Some companies they're ready to go, so it's not a problem. Other cases, a lot of the people in the firm are really worried about AI, right? So there's a second step of education at times, and that's really kind of the culture and change manage management aspect that we tend to help our clients with as well. And then lastly, we also help with AI investment due diligence. So sometimes there are companies who want to go and buy other AI companies. Or they want to think about how do we create more AI in our firm. So sometimes they want to launch an innovation department. Sometimes they want to launch an accelerator. Sometimes they want to do an incubator. Many different ways that you can ultimately do AI there, right? So that part of the AI due diligence process for us is very important as well. And so within investment due diligence, sometimes it's about going and looking at target companies, and in other cases, it's about doing due diligence on the methods by which you bring AI into your firm. So those are really our four key service offerings、uh, in relation to what we can do with AI. In addition to、uh, doing the work on on the consulting side as well, I also do a lot of teaching as part of our kind of education and AI awareness.、Uh, with regards to the teaching,、um, I teach at the University of Hong Kong. 
Uh, and I teach a course called uh, Artificial Intelligence for Business Leaders. And it's designed mainly for MBA students. Over at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, I also teach a course called uh, Big Data and Finance and a second course called Portfolio Management with FinTech Applications. So Big Data and AI and Big Data within the finance area. And then Portfolio Management with FinTech is really delving down deep into the investment world and how AI is being applied there. Kevin, your background is Indian Portuguese, but you were born and raised in Hong Kong. Then you went to Wharton Business School in the U.S. for studies and work in the U.S., Southeast Asia, and now back to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So if people ask you, where are you from, what would you say? Uh, my first response is I'm pretty confused from, from, where, I, uh, from where I am. Uh, but I think if I look at the place where I spend the most amount of time, that's probably Hong Kong. And so that would be the, the pick that I have. Um, you know, if I, again, I think it really depends on what your metric is for, for where you're from. But uh, for me, I think based on time and also just based on how familiar I am with the place, I think Hong Kong would be the one. And what motivated you to travel around and build your international career? Yeah. So I think when I was first in Hong Kong, um, I went to an international school. And so I met a lot of friends from many different countries. And I often found that people with different perspectives were just interesting, especially the ones that were different from me. Because if ever there was a topic we were discussing, if everyone had the same view, it's kind of a boring conversation. So I would rather, you know, talk to a bunch of different people and figure that out. And I often found that when I found people who were different to me, I was always curious as to why. And so after I began to travel, you know, when I would spend some time, for example, in Michigan and the Midwest of the U.S., I got a sense for why people have the views that they do. Yeah, I moved to the East Coast of New York, got a sense from there how they think. Then in Myanmar, that was, again, completely different. And when I was in Myanmar, it was actually the time when they were going through their uh, change from army rule uh, to you know, Aung San Suu Kyi and kind of a very different way of life. So it was interesting to get a good cultural feel there as well. So, uh, you know, in general, I, I love seeing new things. Uh, I probably also really enjoy new types of food. That's another motivation to travel as well. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, right, the biggest thing for me is different perspectives. So I think once you've lived in all these different places and, and meet a lot of people, you begin to get a better worldview in general. But I think, you know, funnily enough, you also begin to realize what you enjoy the most. Why did you choose AI consulting after working many years, I mean, investment banking and finance? So I did a bunch of different uh, stuff there. Uh, private banking, I looked at both the relationship management side and also the investment side as well. Uh, but I think with, bank, with, with private banking specifically, and I think finance more generally, it, it's really about at the core, you know, making rich people richer. And so at a certain point, at least from a private banking perspective, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, I wanted to do something that had a tangible effect on society and not necessarily just affecting one small part of it. So after going to business school at INSEAD, um, I asked myself, where can I really make a difference? And as I thought about it, I felt that technology was the way to go. But I think making a transition from finance to technology straight away is actually very difficult. And so as I was looking around for a bunch of different roles, I had the good fortune of meeting a, a guy from Wharton MBA who, was a, who actually helped to start some big telecommunication companies in China. And he was running um, a fund and he said, you know, we were looking to do some projects in Myanmar. Would you be interested? So I felt that working at a frontier market would be interesting from a life perspective. So I think that would have been cool. And then I also think it would have allowed me to see how technology can impact people. So once you get to Myanmar, you see how technology you put in the ground, things like a cell phone tower, a data center, how that can affect rural farmers. You get to really see the effect of technology. And so after my stint in Myanmar, I asked myself, which area of technology do I think is going to create the most amount of change and have the most amount of impact? And as I looked around, artificial intelligence seemed the one that's really going to have the effect. And so therefore, I thought you know, AI would be the right place to go. And uh, in the past 10 years, can you tell me like one small thing that made a big difference in your life? Pretty profound Say like, question. you know, to, yeah, yeah, so significantly improve your life or productivity. One um, small thing, one small change. I would actually say the biggest change that I've seen is probably um, mentors who I've had. And I think the mentors who I've had uh, are and the ones who made the most impact have always told me that having good EQ is actually really important and being self-aware. 
So understanding people, I think that's probably ultimately the biggest one. And that awareness of people and that kind of, you know, being able to deal with them actually came from my mentors. Many of my mentors were not necessarily the best sort of technical people, but they could read people really well and adapt to situations really well. So they would always talk to me about things like psychology, things about like, how are people thinking? What, what is motivating their actions? And I think when you're not sort of so self-aware, I think at the beginning, you're always perhaps thinking, oh, this person is doing this to me because of something I've done. But once you become more cognizant of what's going on, I think your EQ level goes up. And I think that EQ level awareness increase uh, for me has been the biggest difference. So then, for example, when you go to a place like New York, there's a certain way people act, right? There's a certain way you get business done. Then you go to a place like Myanmar. And if you do the same things from a cultural perspective in Myanmar, it's never going to work. You got to focus more on relationships. You got to focus more on trust building. And that's how you get things done, you know, in certain other places. And how did you find your mentors? You know, I wish I could tell you it was a really good process and I was like smart about like finding them. Honestly, many of them were dumb luck. It's just like right place, right time. Um, but I think to a certain extent, you, you start to figure out what type of people you gel with. I think that's important. Um, I think the other part about having a good mentor-mentee relationship is being vulnerable. I think you really need to, um, if you're going to embrace that, I think it's partly the mentee being vulnerable. And I also think sometimes the mentor are vulnerable as well, uh, because you need to have an exchange. I think if you have a mentor-mentee relationship, that's only one direction. I think it's imbalanced, right? It doesn't work well that way. For example, the one mentor that I'm thinking about who had really, really high EQ, he actually was really, really bad in terms of some of the financial like methods and how to value companies and, and investments and things like that. So I felt like I could help him with one thing and then he could help me with the other. So mm-hmm. I found maybe it's part of the mentor, men, good mentors that I found. They've always had something that I could help them with. And I feel like that led to a more balanced kind of uh, relationship. Your favorite quote? I think it was Maya Angelou who said, people don't remember what you say. They remember how you make them feel. And I think that's a really good one because it kind of ties into a lot of the career stuff we've been talking about so far and looking at how do you deal well with people? Uh, because I emphasize again, you know, when I was in private banking, I met a lot of very rich and successful people. And I always ask myself, what's the common trait that they all have? And I actually found it wasn't necessarily technical knowledge or specific like kind of things they knew. And they would also admit a part of it was good luck on their part. But I think all of them were really good EQ people. I'll take another quote from Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. I think when your EQ is really good, you can use that both for good things as well as for evil as well. But you can be manipulative and you can get your things done. Or you can also be cooperative and get your things done as well. Kevin, I know you read a lot. Can you tell me, like, what's the book you gifted the most or, like, the book, your favorite book? The most recent one, actually, is more about, obviously, related to AI, right? Because I've had to learn a lot of AI very quickly. Um, And I think whenever you try to learn a subject, uh, it's really important to understand some of the history that goes behind it. So there's a book right now um, by a guy called Kai-Fu Lee. It's called AI Superpowers. And I personally think it's a really good examination of um, AI and how it developed. And and that guy has experience both kind of in different types of companies, you know, some Western, some Eastern, and he's looked at kind of how is AI building in those two places. And what are the most important things you want people to remember? So your elevator pitch. Oh, about myself? Yes. I think uh, about me overall, I guess the important kind of aspects that I, I would want them to remember. So number one, I would say my elevator pitch is, is much more about just being humble. So I think it's more about life if I was to give an elevator pitch. And I think from a life perspective, I think a few things for me that have been important. Uh, I think one in life, be humble. I think if you pretend to know everything, A, you don't because there's always going to be someone smarter than you. And B, I just think it's, it's off-putting to a lot of people, right? So be humble. Uh, always try and um, listen to kind of what they, uh, what they have to say. Uh, sometimes, don't get me wrong, they're going to be full of hot air. And then other times, you're going to have to have really good uh, things to tell you about. So I would say that, kind of number one, uh, be humble. I think number two, enjoy your life a little bit. And number three, cherish the people around you. Because I think at the end of the day, life's really about relationships more than anything else. Thank you so much, Kevin. What a journey. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please subscribe on Apple Podcast, 
Google Podcast, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to the podcast, and share it with your friends as helping each other and growing together is just so much fun. Head to www.stephanlinme.com for additional tips and info. Remember, play the long game and be great every day. Bye. Ciao. 下次见。